to the Three Links Oddcast, your spooky podcast for all things having to do with Odd Fellowship. This is our special cemetery episode, so listen if you dare. <laughs> And now, here are your hosts. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of the Three Links Oddcast. I'm your host, Toby Hansen. And I'm Sergio Paredes. Ainsley's still working on his mural project, so uh, he'll be back shortly with the podcast very soon. Yeah, probably another episode or so. We're wishing him well, hoping the rain holds off. He's doing the mural for the Douglas County Museum there in Illinois. But we have some excellent guests. Uh, Before I introduce them, I want to thank our sponsors, Pig and a Pug Bath Stuff. They produce some excellent bath products. You're going to hear a little more from them later in the show. But for our special episode, we've been promising this for six weeks. This was a subject that was suggested to us by one of our listeners uh, down in the Houston, Texas area. He said, what about Odd Fellows Cemeteries? Because his original introduction to Odd Fellowship was visiting cemeteries and seeing that mysterious carving of those three rings or the letters I-O-O-F. And so that's what got him looking into it. And eventually he joined the lodge down there in Houston. And so to talk about cemeteries, we have three uh, very eminent and well-qualified members who happen to be connected to the world's most famous Odd Fellows Cemetery and it is my pleasure to introduce all of them to you now. We have Brother Eddie LeBeouf III, Brother Michael Duplantier, and Sister Emily Ford. Welcome, everybody. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Thank you, Toby. Uh, my name's Eddie LeBeouf, as you said. I'm the Noble Grand for Crescent City Lodge Number 73 down in New Orleans. We are the first uh, lodge to come back to New Orleans after 40 years of no Oddfellows Lodge in New Orleans, and I'm currently the Deputy Grand Master of Louisiana Grand Lodge. Excellent, and uh, I understand you have a, a few other fraternal involvements as well. Why didn't you tell us about those too? Well, I'm also a Freemason, and I, uh, my, I'm currently, I'm a past master of Level Lodge number 373, uh, but I'm also a, I'm currently the Senior Warden of Etoile Polaire Lodge number one, which is also, well, it's the second oldest lodge Masonic Lodge in Louisiana, chartered in 1794, and Albert Pike, who was an odd fellow, um, a Grand Master, uh, in fact, in Arkansas, sat in a chair that's still in the east over there at Etoile Polaire. But even more interesting is that Louisiana number one Odd Fellows Lodge, the oldest Odd Fellows Lodge in Louisiana, also used to meet at Etoile Polaire, and some of their stuff is still there. Wow. So we're really excited about that. Uh, other than that, I'm also active in the Scottish Rite, for those of you who knows what any of that means. Uh, I'm a 32nd degree Knight Commander of the Court of Honor. I'm going up as Venerable Master for the New Orleans Albert Pike Lodge of Perfection. This is a smaller body. Uh, there's only five Venerable Masters in uh, Louisiana, and uh, it takes a little while to get there. And once again, for those who knows what it might mean, I'm also Grand King of the Louisiana Royal Arch Masons, which means next year, If they're so inclined, I will be moving up as the Grand High Priest of Royal Arch Masons. It's a smaller appendant body, kind of like Royal Arch Masonry is like what the encampment is to um, the Odd Fellows Lodge. So it's a smaller group for both both organizations. But uh, in other anatomy, I also uh, am active in Toastmasters. I'm a Distinguished Toastmaster DTM. Um, Jimmy Humphreys, past Sovereign Grand Master, is also a DTM, and um, it just helps me do better in leadership and public speaking, at least I try. Wow, and you still have time to be an odd fellow. I am impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's a labor of love. That's more than labor. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. And uh, Brother Michael, tell us a little bit about yourself. 
Well, I'm a retired attorney. I retired uh, three years ago after 47 years of practice, mostly in the field of state work, or what we call succession work here in Louisiana. I have actually a fairly recent history as a member of Othello. I, I just joined the local lodge, the one that Eddie referred to in February when we were first chartered. But my history with the order goes back a little bit further. I, for the last six and a half years, I've been serving as, uh, I guess you call I don't actually have a title, but you might call it the caretaker of Odd Fellows Rest Cemetery in New Orleans. And that was sort of a serendipitous thing. I, I have a long history, uh, volunteer history with cemeteries going back to the middle 1970s. And uh, I, I got to be somewhat well known for some, my cemetery connection. But at some point, about seven or eight years ago, someone mentioned Odd Fellows and its condition at that time. And I just made an inquiry about it, trying to find who was in charge of the cemetery, which was not an easy thing at that time, by the way. Amazingly, and it's a, it's a long story, but I'll keep it very short. I went to the cemetery one day, and sure enough, because it, it, you could get in at that time, and sure enough, there was a, an official with the Odd Fellows there. He happened to be there at the same time. It was an amazing coincidence. And we got to chatting, and this was back in 20, late 2013, and it kind of grew from there. Um, he was looking for someone to sort of take over the cemetery, and I was looking for something to do, I guess. And um, it, it was a marriage made in heaven, and I've been working at the cemetery ever since. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for <laughs> stepping up to take care of the cemetery. The cemeteries do not get a whole lot of mention unless something bad happens. It's one of those things where right. if someone vandalizes a cemetery, all of a sudden everybody is upset and they think, how could we let that happen? But the other 99.5% of the time, they don't even realize that cemeteries exist and that people need to take care of them. So thank you very much for stepping up and doing that. And mm -hmm. speaking of taking care of cemeteries, we have another member here, and that's Sister Emily Ford. Uh, Sister Emily, go ahead and tell us about you and uh, what it is that you do. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I'm Emily Ford, and I am a member of Crescent City Lodge number 73 um, since the beginning of February. Um, my background is as a uh, cemetery mason, a monumental mason. Uh, I work, I've worked in New Orleans cemeteries for 10 years, and in what, 2014, or 2015, uh, Michael Duplantier and I have, have, you know, kind of run in the same circles. And uh, I had the very, very distinct honor to work under his supervision in Odd Fellows Rest for four years, doing um, repairs to tablets. I think we ended up all told repairing something more than 100 tablets. Um, you know, uh, other, other aspects of the, the sort of common areas of the cemetery, um, getting the cemetery to a point where, you know, we're really, really, uh, you know, restoring it, um, which is what Michael continues to do over there. Um, I've never seen a cemetery authority do that in a cemetery. Um, and it's also one of the most beautiful places I've worked. And so anyway, I get to, uh, continue uh hearing about that from michael um and and uh, i want to stay involved uh it's a big big motivation for me to join also uh in general i own a company called oak and laurel cemetery preservation i've repaired i think something more than 100 tombs across the state of louisiana and uh i do a blog and some you know sort of outreach showing people how to you know responsible practices uh, for cemetery preservation and on the side, or uh, maybe not so much on the side, I also serve as the uh, superintendent of cemeteries for the city of New Orleans. Oh, wonderful. Now, Eddie told us what position he holds in your lodge. Uh, what position do you hold, Emily? I am a left scene supporter. Ooh, that's a fun one. I love <laughs> the first initiation I ever actually got to participate in. I got to be left scene supporter. I love that job. And Brother Michael, what about you? What is your role in the Lodge? Well, I am Vice Grand, which is uh, quite an honor for me, being new to the organization, as a member at least, and um, enjoying, enjoying it quite a bit. It's an interesting um, meeting that we put together. We, we met regularly since then, despite the fact that there's been a bit of a shutdown, obviously. Uh, not a good time to be forming, <clears throat> excuse me, to be forming a new organization under the conditions that we all have to work under right now, but we've managed to do it, and it's been my pleasure to serve as Vice Grand. 
wonderful. Now, before we get into the heavy duty cemetery talk, uh, you folks have done something pretty unique in contemporary Odd Fellowship, which is that uh, almost a year ago, you chartered a new lodge. And uh, from what I gather, there had not been a lodge in New Orleans uh, for about 40 years. And somehow this effort got put together to bring Odd Fellowship back to New Orleans. So who wants to tell us about that process? Basically, I just wanted, you know, I didn't want to see it disappear and go in that top player, seeing some, there's, um, there's a widow and orphans box labeled uh, for Louisiana number one, and it has an old date on it. And there's a ballot box for wildly encampment number one. And we, there's no encampment in Louisiana currently. And I just didn't want to see it completely disappear. So for several years, I was trying to contact someone in Louisiana Grand Lodge and without getting into any of the politics of what was going on then, I just wasn't getting any headway with it until I finally got a hold of uh, Sandy uh, Primek, who is now a past grandmaster. At the time, she was grand secretary and she made the arrangements. It took almost a year for, to go from talking to her to uh, I just contacted her once. Um, Finally, um, I said, I noticed your grand sessions in Baton Rouge. Can I attend your grand banquet? She said, sure, come on over. And I did. And then from there, uh, we made arrangements for me to join. As most of you probably know, you only need, on the books, technically five current third degree members to form a, a lodge. Uh, if you're trying to form out of nothing, you need more like 20. But we didn't have any New Orleans Odd Fellows. So from there it was a matter of, we picked up a member here, picked up a member there. And then we just never could get everybody on the same page. One brother uh, was working in Puerto Rico. The other one is way down the bayou, um, away from New Orleans uh, in Cutoff, Louisiana. And finally we made arrangements to get chartered and get a bunch of members all on the same day. It was, it, it was quite a task, but we got it done. So when you were, Looking to, to fill the rosters, how did you go about uh, putting the word out as far as looking for members? Did you use social media or was it more of by word of mouth? Well, it's a little bit of both. Um, so I, I mentioned it to some of my other uh, Lodge brothers and some of them quickly wanted on board because they also didn't want to see it go away. But I basically um, did start a page for the Louisiana Grand Lodge uh, of Odd Fellows and um, I announced on there that we're going to be doing these degrees. I also, on my own personal Facebook, did that Thomas Wildly, we want you to be odd. And uh, from there, people contacted me um, out the blue. I think I contacted Emily. Yeah, I did. I was doing a presentation on Odd Fellows at our Scottish Rite consistory meeting. Um, it was an open meeting with wives, so I could talk about, uh, and, you know, I wasn't going to give away any odd fellow secrets but um normally i'll do an odd a scottish right you know only members only kind of thing so i did that invited michael michael attended that emily showed up for that and both of them were on board we picked up people like that um we picked up another one sue lynn and azari who is currently working on the marvel movie oh if i say it right shing chi and the legend of the ten rings or lost rings but she's a stunt woman and an actress and she just worked on the capone movie and she oh, awesome. had a connection uh her father was an odd fellow and she was in rebecca's in the 90s and she contacted us when she found out she can join she wanted in so we uh she now lives in new orleans so she uh she joined as well so it was a little bit of social media and word of mouth i gotta credit social media a big part Tell me awesome. if I could add a few words. Uh, yeah, Ed, this ahead. is all Eddie's doing, but no one can take or would want to take any credit for this uh, uh, other than Eddie. He deserves all the credit. Uh, it, my interest, though, actually, I've had a, a, a bit of a love affair with local history ever since I was in college, which for me is uh, 50 years ago, right? So, uh, you know, I, I was familiar with Oddfellows history, and then w when I was forming uh, an attachment to the, to the uh, cemetery, I did quite a bit of research, I mean, days of research into the history of the cemetery and so forth. And that really piqued my interest quite a bit. So the, I, I love the history of the organization. I mean, it, it was founded in Louisiana in the 1830s uh, and continued uh, through the Civil War uh, at, uh, and has an, had an illustrious history in the, in the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century. 
at one time had more than 25 local lodges within the parish of Orleans in Louisiana, uh, which is astonishing. It may not be unique uh, to large cities, but it was astonishing to me that there were 25 lodges. But little by little, starting in the 1920s, uh, those numbers drifted down from 25 to 20 to 15, and you, you get the idea. World War II probably pretty much killed it off. And by the late 70s, which is when we, as best we've been able to determine the last lodge, I spoke to the last living New Orleans Oddfellow um, about three years ago, and he told me as best as he could remember the last meeting. He locked the door, so to speak, on the cemetery in 1978. Um, he was the last of the, he was only in his 30s, uh, so he was still living a few years ago. I believe he still is when he was in his 80s at this point, but but the other members were in their 80s, 70s, and 80s, and he, he was the last, uh, he certainly is the last living. So the historic significance of reforming an organization that had been gone for 50, 40 years and an organization that had been here for 150 years, more than 150 years, just struck me as really an important thing to do. And I give, as I said, Eddie, every credit for having pulled it all together. Now, that brings up a question, and this is something uh, that I have wondered about. Because it's a question that's going to start coming up more and more uh, in jurisdictions around the U.S. and Canada. Speaking about my jurisdiction in Washington, um, we've got some very old lodges that have given up their charters. Uh, for example, Enterprise Lodge Number 2 was chartered in Walla Walla, Washington in 1863. And that lodge gave up their charter, I want to say, in 2014. And so the question is, if a new lodge were to start in Walla Walla, would they want to resurrect Enterprise Number 2, or would they want to go with a new name and number? Now, it sounds like your lodge there in New Orleans had any number of lodge names and numbers that you could resurrect, but you chose Crescent City 73. And uh, tell us about that decision. I can field that a little bit. It was kind of a, and it's something we talked about. Um, basically, we were told that if we resurrected a charter, that we would be on our own uh, as far as getting like stuff in storage. I don't know if they meant even the jewels and all too, because um, they gave us all kind of stuff. We got jewels, we got a ballot box, we got a Bible, we got minute books. So I never did really ask um, whether or not we would have got anything had we resurrected a charter. But at the time, I didn't know if we were going to need any of that stuff they were talking about that was in storage. Turns out we didn't because we were leasing from a lodge building. Maybe we should have resurrected a charter, but that's what was told me to me. And I don't know how hard and fast the rule was. If we would have resurrected a charter, would they really have said, no, you can't have this? I don't know. But um, it just seemed at the end easier to just pick a new name and, and go with the new number. But uh, I do think eventually, we're, I would like to keep Crescent City. I like to see a, um, a lodge in Kenner, which is if you ever gone to New Orleans and flown into New Orleans, you're not in New Orleans. You are actually in Kenner, Louisiana, and you're about 10 minutes away from the city. I'd like to see a lodge in Kenner as well as in the, the New Orleans area and try to, ha I think we can support two eventually. So maybe mm -hmm. next time we will resurrect the charter. Now, do you find more people are, are reaching out right now, especially this year with more people staying inside? Have you seen like a increase in people just asking questions or, or anything like that? Well, we, we did have some petitions come through. Um, I think it is a little slower than it could be if we wouldn't be under these um, coronavirus uh, stuff going on. and Because um, we do meet in person since about July. Uh, but we, the lodge we meet at is a Masonic lodge and it's very large. And we're able to socially distance and we have masks and we get close to each other. And uh, I don't want to uh, go any details in the opening, but there, no, there is a certain <laughs> portion in the opening, let's just say that, where it would require close contact. We do forego that for safety reasons and safety precautions. I think it will pick up, but we do have petitions. That's wonderful. We actually do the same thing in Washington. Um, right now, we're all in different phases of reopening, depending on what county you're in. So uh, I'm in Pierce County and we're in phase two, but the governor has allowed business meetings of up to 30 people. So what we do, we spread out around our lodge hall 
And when the warden would normally go around and take up the password, uh, the noble grand just asks, is everyone present a member? The warden looks around and verifies and reports to the noble grand. So we're not actually giving the grip, we're not taking up the password, uh, and our grandmaster has authorized us to meet that way for safety precautions. And I, I think that's a very good way to do it because it allows us to keep functioning as a lodge and still maintain a, a high degree of safety for our members. Unfortunately, where I'm at in, in, uh, in California, we're still on lockdown. So there's uh, pretty much all the lodges are still dark right now. And then uh, even just regular social gatherings, I believe it's limited at five to 10 people. So uh, we're not quite there on this side of the states. Um, I feel like even when it opens up, it's still irresponsible yeah, to, to, to not do this, to get close if we don't have to. Yeah, you know, the more precautions we can take, the better, especially considering that more so even than other fraternal orders, our membership skews older. You know, we want to make sure that uh, we have the wisdom and experience of those senior members as long as possible. <laughs> it's just a matter of uh, adjusting to the times. So you folks are down there in New Orleans, and you have uh, what I and most other people would consider to be the world's most famous Odd Fellows Cemetery. There have been albums named after it, so many pictures taken there, and so much attention for a cemetery. I, I would even venture to say that it could be one of the most well-known cemeteries, period. What is it like to have this wonderful jewel of Odd Fellows history there in your city? I'd like to hear Emily's perspective, but we'll all give our yeah, perspective yes. on that. You know, I have to say, when it, when you're in New Orleans working in cemeteries, kind of, it, the perspective is very different, right? You know, you're used to, I mean, everybody sees cemeteries from the, like New Orleans cemeteries from the outside as, you know, it's sort of, you know, different or exotic. For for me, at least, you know, the interesting thing about our cemeteries is their differences from one another. And Odd Fellows among New Orleans cemeteries, which are all, you know, very special in their own ways, Odd Fellows is, without question, the most peaceful. I think maybe that's what it's like having that cemetery. It's just, it's just so peaceful. It's walled in um, and, it's, and it's very small. And it is one of the places that it's, it is so easy to imagine what it looked like in its past because it retains so much of its original material. Um, it's so easy to just imagine what it would have been like to be in that cemetery a hundred years ago or 150 years ago. And it, at least for me, and I'm, and I'm pretty sure Michael feels this way too, for the way that the cemetery is you know, so fragile that visitation is restricted, being in that cemetery makes you feel really special. <laughs> you know, you, you really get to, to experience something that others can't, and, 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 and which is, that's what keeps it so protected. So, I mean, even myself, I work in all 40 of the historic cemeteries of New Orleans, including National Historic Landmarks, and Oddfellows is, uh, is, is certainly, you know, in its own league. For anyone who's not familiar with cemeteries in the city of New Orleans, given where you are in relationship to your aquatic surroundings, you have very, very unique methods of burial there. So for anyone who's not familiar with that, you should probably mention what makes your cemeteries so unique. I hear, uh, I hear um, Michael <laughs> kind of giggling. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So um, Michael, do you mind if I, if I do this? If I Go it? ahead, Emily. Okay. I, you're as much uh, more an authority <laughs> than I am, but I do have some comments about that. Sure. Sure. Um, so um, one thing, w w what is, you know, this is, it's a, the water table actually does not have very much to do with it. Um, today okay. I was working in Lafayette Cemetery Number no. 1, which is a National Historic Landmark founded in 1833. It is solidly six feet above sea level. We can absolutely bury below ground. Um, we have eight Jewish cemeteries in the city of New Orleans. They are all buried, you know, below ground burial is a tradition in those cemeteries. Um, the little, um, the, our burial practices, which are primarily above ground, but that is really for, um, cultural reasons. Um, it's a tradition that we got somewhat from our, well, architecturally from our Spanish colonial influences, or sorry, architecturally from our French colonial influences, but um, in terms of function, a lot from our Spanish colonial influences. If you see cemeteries in the Philippines 
Puerto Rico, uh, Cuba, you'll see very similar structures. And so this is something that was sort of brought to New Orleans from Europe and became sort of I mean, it, it certainly was helpful when you didn't want to dig a grave that had water coming into it, you know, so there's certainly some, you know, some practicality there. But um, I suppose, I, I don't know how much detail you want, but we bury in little houses that have little vaults in them, and they are primarily above ground. Excellent. That's, that's the important thing that people who may not be familiar with the famous cemeteries in New Orleans, they're above ground vaults. And so you have these wonderful, beautiful architectural masterpieces that are just amazingly, incredibly beautiful. And it, it really creates a very unique feel to your cemeteries down there. Um, yeah. You had mentioned something about a blog by any chance. Do you, have, uh, do you share pictures of, of uh, some of these uh, cemeteries on there or...? If somebody wanted to get a, <laughs> an idea of some of the, the grave sites and everything, where, where, uh, where can we uh, see those? So uh, my website is Oak and Moral. Um, so the, like the two plants, uh, Oak, O-A-K-A-N-D-L-A-U-R-E-L.com. Um, and you can find it on uh, my blog is, is linked through that, that webpage. Because Oddfellows has had the kind of issues in the past with folks like, say, trespassing, getting getting squirrely in there. Don't have a whole lot of pictures of odd fellows in there, I'll be honest, because for the time that I worked there, I didn't really want to flaunt that I had some sort of special access. But yeah, there's still lots of pictures of New Orleans cemeteries. Yeah, I wanted to add a little bit on Emily's comment. She's absolutely correct about that. In one of the earliest uh, written history of the odd fellows organization in Louisiana, dated as, as I recall in 1877, it mentions that the cemetery was built in the what they called the European tradition, uh, and it would, by that time, by the, the cemetery opened in 1849. So by that time, it, it was in fact a local tradition to follow uh, sort of the cultural antecedents from both France and, and Spain in terms of how you bury the dead. A water table. Uh, I mean, every one of the tour guides who gives cemetery tours in the city will tell you we bury above ground because of the water table, but. Uh, Look, I'm not saying that wasn't an issue. It probably was. But most of the cemeteries, they tried to build on on, on higher ground uh, by and large. And, and so water table was not so much an issue. I, I would say the vast majority of the reason they did this was because of the, of this tradition, this cultural and, and architectural tradition, actually. I used to give a presentation on New Orleans cemeteries, and I, I used to show slides, side-by-side -side slides from Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, with a few slides of or, uh, some, a couple of the local cemeteries and sort of divide people to identify which was which. Now there are, there are actually ways you can do that, but but for someone who's not that knowledgeable about it, they could not tell the difference. So clearly, uh, that was the primary reason. And a lot of the local architects who who did tomb work were schooled in Europe, um, and some of them were immigrants from Europe. So. There was a vast cultural connection between New Orleans and the, the great cities of, uh, of France, primarily in terms of th this type of construction, and it endures to this day. Now, it's the the height of this archi funereal architecture was in the 19th century. Uh, it's too expensive to kind of build the try to build the kind of tombs they built back then to, to today. Unless you were very very wealthy, you couldn't afford to do that today. Well, that's some great information. Now, another question, and this is something that uh, I run into quite a bit. People always ask me, why cemeteries? Why is it that the Odd Fellows are so involved in cemeteries? And I, I have to admit, I don't have uh, a really good, coherent answer for that. So I'd like to get some input from any of you who think you have uh, a good idea about that. To my understanding, I mean, it, Oddfellows at one time, like a lot of fraternal organizations, functioned sort of like um, a burial insurance policy. Um, if you were a member, you could be buried. Um, even uh, in Freemasonry, that was to a limited extent. To this day, um, some lodges will still have a Masonic cemetery where you could be buried for free if you're indigent but usually um, you would have to pay for it. But I think it all stemmed from a sort of quasi burial insurance type thing. But then later that became a mute point when insurance companies came online. It 
but yet they still had cemeteries is what I'm guessing. You know, I, I mentioned the other day, and we had some correspondence back and forth about this subject, and I, I mentioned that I felt to some extent, I don't know the answer to that, Toby, but I, I think it was just part of that continuum, what I call the continuum of care that the Odd Fellows felt responsibility for. I mean, they took care of widows and orphans. They took care of stranger brothers. And then ultimately, especially in the 19th century, they had to care for their the disposal of their their earthly remains. Uh, and I think it was just part of that con continuum of care. They saw it as part of their responsibility. Although, as a, we can talk about this later if you like, but I, I, there's, you know, there's a real downside to that. I mean, providing care for someone during their lifetime is one thing. Providing perpetual care for their remains for the next 250 years is something entirely different. Yes, it is. And that's one of the ways in which Odd Fellowship has really been challenged. Uh, I know that in my jurisdiction of Washington, we've had a lot of challenges with either a little bit of a cemetery that a lodge owned that they didn't take care of, that has five or six graves, the lodge went defunct, nobody knew what happened to it. You know, in some cases, that we do still have lodges that actively run their cemeteries. For example, in the middle of nowhere in eastern Washington, there's a little town called Bickleton, and it's about, oh, I don't know, maybe 40 miles southeast of Yakima. And they still have a very active Oddfellows Lodge. They have the only two-story building in the entire town of Bickleton. And they have the cemetery. So anything that happens in that town having to do with the cemetery or a funeral goes through the Oddfellows and the Rebecca's. The Rebecca's will put on the funeral luncheon. The Oddfellows will handle the burial at the cemetery. But it happens where you get this, these cemeteries that are orphaned after lodges go away. And that is a real serious problem. Um, the famous one in my area is the old Comet Lodge Cemetery. And uh, anybody who lives in the, the south side of Seattle is probably familiar with it. Comet Lodge 139 was chartered early 20th century. It was primarily uh, Slavic immigrants. It was located in South Seattle in the Georgetown neighborhood. And the cemetery was part of the lodge. It was a very active, very well-used cemetery. They had what they called an angel's garden, which had uh, burials of infants and babies. They had a, a very large section for members. Sometime in the 1930s, the lodge went away in some way. I don't know if they gave up their charter, consolidated with another lodge, or exactly what happened. Somehow, the cemetery was supposedly transferred to a doctor at the public hospital. The whole trail of paperwork of who owned the cemetery got lost at that point. And so it was in this growing area of South Seattle. And one by one, county would come by and just take some tombstones and bust them up for rubble to fill roadbeds. And part of it became a dog park. Part of it got ripped up so a pipeline could be put through there because there was no one actively defending and taking care of the cemetery. It wasn't until the early 1990s that finally neighbors in the area said, we have to step up and take care of the cemetery so that what little is left is not completely destroyed and forgotten. I understand exactly what you're talking about when you say, it is a serious obligation for this long extended period to take care of a cemetery. Well, I was going to say, I, I you know, I, I mentioned this the other day, but I, I had this I notion that the Oddfellows members and organizations back in the 1830s and 40s just assumed that there would be a never ending, inexhaustible supply of Oddfellows members in, in coming decades and centuries to take care of these cemeteries because as in the case of this local uh, fellows rest cemetery in new Orleans, there was no perpetual care provided for the, the families who had been buried there uh there was no money set aside for the cemetery you know they just dealt with it from year to year the, as best they could and i i don't i don't want to be critical of these gentlemen because they were 
they were really pillars of the community, but I don't think they gave enough thought to how this cemetery was going to maintain itself you know, into the future. I, 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 I have to assume that they always thought Odd Fellows would be a, a large, prosperous, thriving organization and would deal with it at that time. There's no indication that they, they did anything other than that. I think that was systematic for a lot of fraternal organizations. One particular group in New Orleans sold uh, this empty lot next door uh, to their building that later became a paid parking lot that we had to pay to to meet there. And it's just kind of funny knowing that we used to own it. I'm thinking, and I think it was sold like in the 1920s, and maybe you're thinking these newfangled horseless carriages would never catch on. And uh, there was no foresight. I think a lot of groups had a lack of foresight. And I, I think in the end, though, a lot of times we're just volunteers and we're doing the best we can. But um, but I do think at times there was some missed opportunities for thinking ahead a little bit better, for especially for these cemeteries and the perpetual care. Yeah, and I think that's that's pretty much throughout the entire U.S. I'm on the West Coast. So I actually belong to a lodge, Los Angeles Golden Rule 35, and we're still located on the Odd Fellows Cemetery lot. So we're, our lodge is actually in the back lot of the cemetery. As the lodge started getting older and membership started going down, um, from my understanding, they just couldn't, couldn't maintain it. So uh, um, a third party actually runs the cemetery. So it, it's just one of those things like with the when our numbers drop and that's not just here but anywhere it kind of i think it kind of put a lot of pressure as far as being able to maintain the cemetery because the cemetery that my lodge is attached to it's pretty small it's like right in the metro area it's uh, right in the heart of um, uh, east la Boyle heights area so it's i guess it was just one of those things that the, the memberships and the, and the people willing to kind of take over the reins, so to speak, just kind of never met on the same level. And sometimes these cemeteries kind of had to fell out of like the, the lodges, uh, lodges care. And I just have well, to I'm say, gonna... uh, as far as I understand, without the efforts of past Sovereign Grand Master Jimmy Humphreys and Michael Duplantier, my understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, uh, we probably would not have mm -hmm. a cemetery anymore. Um, if between you and Jimmy, I don't believe we would have a cemetery right now they were uh, you know, they were close to pulling it from us right yeah J jimmy humphrey deserves a tremendous amount of credit and as well as his wife joyce i mean they they've been the guiding lights for saving this cemetery we haven't mentioned previously but the cemetery was not in the best of condition and uh, emily can attest to that i'm certain um i mean and that's understating it believe me um a lot of these tombs a brick and mortar and, and brick and mortar is not designed to last forever and ever and ever it just needs regular maintenance and uh, emily you may want to comment about that perhaps yeah well absolutely um i mean and, and michael didn't even mention the the exterior walls of uh the cemetery so like i said it's enclosed um and one of the the aspects of uh what makes New Orleans Cemetery so special is that we have what we call wall vaults, uh, which is basically like a large wall. Of, it was similar to what others, other folks would be familiar with if they went to a community mausoleum, right? Whereas it's, it's simply just like a honeycomb-like wall that is entirely filled with interments. However, ours are Odd Fellows' is exterior, and the exterior walls of it front, front on two very large throughways, a very large uh, traffic, uh, well, very large streets, and. Um, if it weren't for Michael and and for for Jimmy and Joyce, you know, being present when the city was about to do a pretty disruptive road project, that wall probably would have collapsed. I mean, it sounds really drastic, but it really would have. Brick and mortar can can last forever if it is well maintained. However, we're talking about a cemetery that had not been maintained for 50 years or so. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, and there was a time in the 60s that uh, the city of New Orleans would have been very happy to completely demolish Odd Fellows, uh, simply to make the, the traffic situation better at the, the intersection at which it's located. The street has to do a little bit of a turn to accommodate this cemetery. The city very much wanted the cemetery to go away. In fact, for over 100 years, from about the middle 1850s to, um, to, to the 19, 1950s, they they constantly were coming up with new plans to remove the cemetery. And, and interestingly, at some point in the 1960s, the Odd Fellows of Louisiana said, okay, fine, the Grand Lodge, the owner of the cemetery said, okay, pay us for the value of it and you can have it. And, and in fact, uh, that's, 
there was a contract signed to do that, but for complicated reasons, it was never implemented. So the cemetery uh, just continued. And that was one of the reasons they stopped the maintenance because they were, they had agreed to sell the cemetery right away to the, to the city for construction of a new street. And uh, so they stopped maintaining it, as you might imagine. But ultimately that didn't happen because they constructed an interstate highway nearby that made it unnecessary to do that. The consequence was that the odd fellows were left. They didn't get the money they were hoping for. And then they were left with a cemetery that was in massive decline at that point. And if you are at all familiar with the history of San Francisco, that's a city where Odd Fellowship is still very strong. They have the beautiful, gigantic Odd Fellows Temple downtown on Market Street. All the other cities of Odd Fellowship, with maybe the exception of Victoria, British Columbia, are jealous of the lodges that kept their gigantic, beautiful palaces of Odd Fellowship. But the Odd Fellows also did a lot of burials in San Francisco. And when the city was expanded following the San Francisco earthquake, they dug up all of the cemeteries in San Francisco, moved them way, way south on the peninsula down to the city of Colma. Well, the Odd Fellows Cemetery got very short shrift in that transfer. What should have been a respectful and orderly transfer of remains from the old city cemetery that was in the city limits down to the new cemetery in Colma was absolutely a mess. Um, you know, remains all jumbled up together, rubble all over the place. Now, part of what is the quote unquote new Odd Fellows area of the cemetery in Colma is actually a parking lot, a flower farming operation. There's a whole bunch of stuff there because once the Odd Fellows said, okay, city of San Francisco, you can move the graves, proper care was not taken at that point. And uh, that is actually a, a bit of a point of contention uh, in Odd Fellowship in the San Francisco area, how poorly the remains were treated when they were transferred down to Colma. You mentioned, I didn't know that story, but I'm not surprised because I, I think at some point, and I have no idea what it was, the Odd Fellows, I think they realized they made a mistake with, with cemeteries and they they simply lost their enthusiasm for cemeteries. So when they had an opportunity, as you described there in San Francisco, or the opportunity here to sell the cemetery and, and move the remains, uh, you know, they were willing to do so. And I'll give you one other indication of that. Uh, and, and this is astonishing to me. I've asked several officials of the Odd Fellows in the last five years, can, can I have a list of all the Odd Fellow cemeteries in in the United States, <laughs> what do you think the what do you, what do you think the answer was? Uh, one guess. I know the answer already. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a list, and I I you know I really felt that was amazing to me that there's not even a list of the Odd Fellow cemeteries. Well, I, this is one thing that I can speak a little bit about, having served as Grand Master of my jurisdiction and having had a couple years involved at the Sovereign Grand Lodge level. For many, many jurisdictions, the sort of death spiral that has been going on in Odd Fellowship, and I, I kind of hate to use the term death spiral, but that's pretty accurate. The death spiral has really made survival a challenge. And so things that an outsider would think, oh, they must have records of all the members from each lodge, or every Odd Fellow Cemetery, or they must have understanding of this, or they, there's got to be a way to do that. Many of those sort of second order, non-absolutely functional survival tasks were just left by the wayside. Now, in my jurisdiction, we have a Grand Lodge Cemetery Committee, and I know that any of the committee members could tell you each and every single active cemetery that is still going in our jurisdiction because we have not had nearly as serious a near-death experience as other jurisdictions. But for example, um, I visited other jurisdictions out west here where the Grand Lodge is very small. Their annual budget is $4,000 and there are only seven lodges left in the state. And that's talking about a state that may have had 150 lodges at its peak. And so they simply don't know 
they don't even know where the records would have gone of what lodges had cemeteries and where they were. As another example of this, not every individual lodge keeps the best records so that when they do turn in their charter to the Grand Lodge, Grand Lodge doesn't always get the records that they need to be able to do their job. We got a letter at the Grand Lodge um, in the last couple of years from a landowner outside of Tenasket, Washington, who said, uh, there's spike weed on your property that is impacting my property. You need to take care of it. All of us at the Grand Lodge are sitting around going, what? We don't have any land outside of Tenasket. But we did some research and we found out there was a grant from the federal government to the old Tenasket Lodge, uh, 40 acres up on the hill, away from the valley. You could use it as a cemetery. Fortunately, no one was ever buried there, but that land bequest that was given to the Tenasket Lodge then went to the Grand Lodge when Tenasket turned in their charter, which means that we didn't even realize it, but we had this 40-acre parcel up on the hill that had been given to the local lodge for cemetery use and never been used. So that was something that we, we then had to start the process with the federal government of saying, can we give this back to you now? The lodge is gone. Nobody's buried there. There is nothing but a bunch of weeds up there. And so <laughs> you would think anyone from outside the organization would think, oh, the odd fellows, of course they have records of every single burial in every single cemetery in North America. But you'd be wrong. <laughs> I can speak a little bit about records and hidden cemeteries if you want, Toby. Oh, please um, do. Okay, so I can tell you, like, for um, in my Masonic organization, see, it's harder to talk about Oddfellows in Louisiana when we only have five lodges, and some of them aren't real. Well, we have six now, but and some of them aren't very active, let's say. But I can tell you a lot of Masonic lodges, we suffer from one copy records, and you get fires. You get no. floods. Then in some cases, we have the records, but they're sitting in a warehouse somewhere. There was an effort, and there's an ongoing effort, to digitize it, at least for Louisiana Freemasonry. But even then, if it uploads to PDF, you can't, it makes it difficult to search for things. But those are, I think those three things, between sitting in a warehouse, fires, floods, oh, and just throwing stuff out. And is, I've heard stories of lodges saying, secretary decided just throw everything out where they were at his house he passed away and nobody asked for it and no telling where it's at now for hidden cemeteries i can tell you i found a hidden one in slidell um i use um i love cemetery symbolism um my eighth grade louisiana history teacher did a whole week on, on iconology uh, of cemeteries and I, it created a love of symbolism in cemeteries and um, so I, I use Find a Grave a lot. You can use the Find a Grave app to actually look at cemeteries in your vicinity and you can see where you're at and where they're at. And I noticed in Slidell, Louisiana, there's, there was an Odd Fellows Rest Cemetery showing up and I had no idea there was supposed to be one there. Now, when I got there, it is basically some graves in a woods mm -hmm. and I couldn't find it first, any three links anywhere. Me and uh, my fiance, Millie, went deeper into the woods. We actually, and I have pictures of it, there's a few uh, slabs that have three links on it. So at first I thought it was mislabeled, but once I found those, it tells me at one time it was an Odd Fellows Rest Cemetery. So you got that one hidden. Uh, in Shreveport, there's a large cemetery called Greenwood. Within Greenwood, there is a section with an arch at Odd Fellows Rest within Greenwood. So it's kind of like a cemetery within a cemetery. And I do believe Neath number 21 does control that particular section or has something to do with it. And in Louisiana, the only other one I know of was for Home Lodge, uh, which I believe we just sold most of that land minus the cemetery. We still own the cemetery. It's in Crowley, Louisiana. And I think that's all we have that I know of, but there's probably more in Louisiana. But finding a grave discovered uh, an Odd Fellows Rest Cemetery for me. Wow, that's very impressive. Well, I think this is a good point to uh, drop a commercial break in here. So we're going to come back and talk some more about cemeteries right after this message from our sponsors, Pig and a Pug Bath Stuff. <laughs> Thank you. 
Ah, you can feel it in that late summer breeze. Autumn is just around the corner with its chilly mornings and cozy evenings. Why not give yourself the gift of beautiful scented bath products? Pig and a Pug Bath Stuff is introducing their new fall scents for 2020. The soothing, calming smells of autumn are now available in all your favorite soaps, scrubs, and other bath stuff. Made of the finest ingredients right in rugged Missoula, Montana, Pig and a Pug Bath Stuff gives you a little bit of luxury in your everyday cleansing routine. The time is never better to pamper yourself than right now, because they've generously extended their special offer to listeners of the Three Links Oddcast. Use the code THANKYOU24 at checkout, that's the words THANK YOU and the number 24 at checkout, to receive 24% off your purchase. Once you've tried the smooth, wonderful bath stuff from Pig and a Pug, you'll want to indulge in a luxurious bath as often as possible. Remember, Pig and a Pug Bath Stuff. Look them up on Facebook and Etsy and use the code THANKYOU24 at checkout for a 24% discount. Happy bathing! And we're back. Thank you very much to our sponsors, Pig and a Pug Bath Stuff. Be sure and check out their fall collection because uh, you've only got uh, a few weeks left. I'm not sure how many, but just a few weeks left with their excellent fall collection. Then they turn over to the winter stuff. So be sure and stock up now. So before the break, we were talking with uh, Brother Eddie LeBeouf, uh, Brother Michael Duplantier, and Sister Emily Ford all members of Crescent City Lodge number 73 in New Orleans, Louisiana. And we've been kind of talking about Oddfellows Cemeteries because uh, they happen to have one of the nicest, fanciest, and most famous down there in New Orleans, the Oddfellows Rest. I'm kind of curious about uh, maybe the dedication of the Oddfellows Rest Cemetery. With such a fancy cemetery, it seems like there had to be something special that was done to dedicate that cemetery. Is one of you, you want to kind of talk about that? Yes, I'll be happy to. Uh, tip, I think probably fairly typical of the Odd Fellows of the time, uh, they didn't just open the cemetery. They had the, the, what I believe, based on my research, was the largest parade in the city of New Orleans up to, up to that time. Uh, there were over 1,100 odd fellows who participated in the parade in full regalia. Uh, and by the way, the reason I know this is bec uh, because it was written up in the newspaper. It was a major event in the newspaper. And, and to get to the cemetery at that time, which actually at that time was about two miles outside the city limit, they had to travel by barge through, on a waterway. So they put all these odd fellows in full regalia on, the, on this, I think more than one barge, actually a series of barges. They also had circus wagons, horses. Uh, it was just a very elaborate parade. Uh, and it went on all day, by the way. And they, 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 they marched the route to get to the point where they got on the barges. They had already marched the route of about four miles. It was a serious thing. And t I think fairly typical of the Odd Fellows. I mean, they were people who understood celebration. And even the celebration of a cemetery was a significant and signal event in the history of the city. And uh, I, they, uh, the newspaper actually printed the remarks of the uh, top Odd Fellow official who spoke that day. And he must have talked for an hour because, the, I mean, I, I've never actually read the entire remarks. I, I, he, I, they, they reprinted his entire remarks in the newspaper. So it'll give you some idea of the importance of the organization um, in the middle 19th century, it was extremely important. So everything they did, including their routine meetings that were written up in the newspaper, were reported on by the newspaper at that time. So it was a, it was an extremely momentous event. And, and at the risk of belaboring this, it was interesting because less than two weeks before the the installation of, of the inauguration of the new cemetery there had been a, a typhoid fever epidemic in the city, and the city had been shut down for two months. But that didn't stop the odd fellows. Nothing stops the odd fellows. And, and they waited for it to, to end. And w within two weeks after it ended, they had this big parade. Um, you think they would use a little more caution, perhaps, but they did what they did. They were ready to get it open. And um, that's what they did. 
Now, you mentioned before the break, you sometimes have problems. Like you wanted to contact Sovereign Grand Lodge and get a list of all the Odd Fellow Cemeteries. They didn't really have that kind of resource readily available for you. Are there other kinds of issues you've run into with uh, these sort of distributed volunteer record keeping systems? Well, I, I can mention one. This actually just happened within the last three days. I got a call from a family member of, a, of someone buried in a cemetery, never spoke to her before. And uh, she hadn't been, not been there in a number of years, and she wanted to make a visit. And she said, you know, I have a copy of the burial record. Um, she said, when I was last there in 1982, I went into the what she called the lodge building, and and with, there's a little building associated with the cemetery, although it's it's leased out right now. But and she said I went through the burial records, and I was astonished because I have never seen the burial records. And so they, it's the, the records still existed as recently as 1982, and they made them available to people to to find find their their relatives, find where they were buried. But some time some time between 1982 and 2020. Um, they disappeared, and I have I have actually searched for five years now for those records, and it's been a pointless and fruitless search. I was told they were lost in a flood. Uh, someone else told me they were lost in a fire, um, but nobody really knows. And th uh, I, I talked to uh, there's a gentleman still living. He's in his 80s who used to run the cemetery back in the 1960s. I know he had possession of them. He he couldn't remember. But anyway, this the point was this is fa I think fairly typical of a decentralized volunteer organization. The records are kept by one person, by an individual. Um, and when that person loses interest or passes away, um, things get lost. In fact, I know for a fact, a gentleman who ran the cemetery, he was in Odd Valley in the 1990s. He died about four or five years ago. And before we found out that he had died, uh, his daughter told us that she had thrown away all that old Odd Fellow stuff. Um, it, it, I mean, in my heart, so you know, that, but that kind of thing continues to happen, uh, even to this day. Oh yeah. As a past grandmaster, I am familiar with that. You go visit a lodge and you say, Hey, where's the records? Let me see the books. And that's when you find out, well, our secretary took the minute book home and he's been sick for the last couple of months. He hasn't come to lodge. Uh, his kids won't let us into the house so we can get the books back. Our record keeping is very fallible. <laughs> it is. Another issue, what about all of these old graves? You know, you've got the beautiful headstones. You've got the, um, the beautiful architecture in the cemetery. How do you go about preserving that? Let's say we've got a lodge. They're listening to the podcast and they say, well, heck, we've got a cemetery, but it's overgrown with weeds. We've never done anything with it. Let's get out there and fix it up and maintain it and really take some pride and show the public that we still exist. What uh, kind of information would any of you have for someone who wanted to do something like that? Um, I'd love to jump in here. So I actually, I wanted, I can't believe I didn't mention this like right at the top. Um, I, I wanted to first mention like the first cemetery that made me realize that I, I want to work in cemeteries and, I, and I'm attached to cemeteries was an Odd Fellows Cemetery in um, Grass Valley, Oregon. I don't know if you've been to that one, Toby. You I, look like I you have. I'm familiar with that cemetery. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was, uh, I lived in Eugene for two years, uh, which has a beautiful Masonic cemetery as well, but, um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time, uh, finding the, the trail in Oregon, which the or old, I think it's the, there's a cutoff of the Oregon trail that goes that way. The Applegate and, trail. Yeah. And I remember seeing it, you know, on the top of a hill and it was so well cared for. It, also, there's a stone in that cemetery that's written in Croatian. Mm -hmm. um, that I spent some time messing around trying to translate. Um, but it was the, ex like the, the, the physical presence of somebody caring, like just like the visible care in that cemetery was so wonderful to me. I was like, I want to, I want to be the person who makes a place look like this. So, and, and I get that impulse from everybody, you know, like the impulse is the great, is the, is the part that makes us, you know, human and good. And, and it's a great impulse. The way we follow through on those impulses really makes a difference though. And there's a lot of guidelines. There's a lot of help for folks. Um, if they're say trying to 
rescue a cemetery from neglect, first thing I would say is that there actually are resources for this. Uh, there's a lot of resources. A, a good place to start is the National Centers for Preservation Technology and Training, uh, NCPTT. Um, they have a website, I think it's at ncptt.mps.gov. They've been doing this for 20 years. They sort of set the standard. In terms of clearing, you mentioned, uh, you know, clearing brush. Um, something that's really, really worth remembering is that impact, marble is really, really susceptible to impact. Um, so you're using those line trimmers, and believe me, I line trim every day. I know how hard it is to keep from hitting stones, but you really want to keep from hitting stones. You don't want to bring that bush hog in there. You want to do it low and slow and not cause any sort of, you know, additional damage. I've even seen people trying to rescue a cemetery from overgrowth, set things on fire. Don't do that. Yeah, no, that's a real thing. Yeah, I, I saw that. Uh, uh, I'm not going to say where I saw that, but... <laughs> Now, in terms of um, caring for stones, um, there's a lot of ways that we can really be harmful to marble, especially, um, you know, things that are corrosive, things that are acidic. Um, so that would be bleach. Bleach is actually really quite harmful to marble. Again, that impulse is awesome. Like the impulse of wanting to make something, you know, care for something is great but we can do a lot more harm than good if we're using the wrong materials. So bleach, muriatic acid, um, really a lot of the stuff that's underneath your kitchen sink is going to, to melt marble like a sugar cube, even if it does make it look whiter um, for a while. Um, the stuff you do want to use, actually, I mean, for folks out West, this is something to re that's really easy to get in feed stores. Um, mm -hmm. It's something called Orvis paste. It's for like, they, I think they use it for horses um, and for quilts but it is a, what, we, what we call um, a non-ionic cleaner. Um, okay. so that means that you can, it, it gets really, really soapy. You don't need a lot of it, but um, it will clean the stone without taking anything out of the stone or putting anything into the stone. It will just simply, it is a non-ionic surfactant. What most of us who work in cemeteries use is something called D2 biological solution, which is essentially quaternary. Well, it's quaternary ammonia, but don't use ammonia. They're very mm -hmm. different things. But D2 biological solution is sort of the industry standard. It works really well. Lots of folks, in, in, you know, really like it. And then for broken stones, uh, um, it's something that's really worth leaving for to professionals. Um, don't don't get don't show up with that liquid nails. Don't show up with that call. Don't show up with that Portland cement quickcrete. Like quickcrete, unless it was made in the past. 20 years, you don't want to be using quickcrete. Keep in mind that something that was put up and saying like 1900, the materials are very different. You want to use the same materials. So, you know, do the research and, and honestly, leave, leave well enough alone, you know, and, and, and speak to professionals when you can. And like I said, uh, NCPCT um, does have, um, I think that there's actually like a whole subject thread um, on gravestones and there's, there's videos that show you how to do these things. Um, there's lists, there's lots of tips. I would t I honestly there's say there's a lot of, we, we cemetery preservationists are a motley crew and we have a great deal of disagreement among us. Um, mm -hmm. I have a master's degree in historic preservation and I do stuff that some people would be like, oh no, no, no. So I would say go to NCPTT. They are the industry standard. They are the ones who you know figured everything out using, you know, they, they've, they've tested every material. They're the folks that you want to, you want to be uh, getting those, that information from. And don't use bleach. Just don't bleach. Don't pressure wash. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> as, as someone who has been involved with uh, lodges that have old buildings, I understand that, uh, you know, sometimes you get people who come in and very well-meaning and they want to do something great. Yeah. My associate lodge, which is in Buckley, Washington, Buckley number 75, that's a town of uh, loggers and farmers and railroad men uh, at one time when the train tracks still went through Buckley. And they were very thrifty. And so on the inside of the brick wall of the lodge hall, rather than do proper lath and plaster, they, they got really cheap quarter inch plywood seconds from the mill and then just stuck it to the wall and ran plaster over it. Okay, that was great, perhaps, oh, I don't know, 100 years ago or maybe 50 or 60 years ago, but now we are left with the problem that all of that old plaster is cracking 
at right angles. It would be very much at home in a Masonic lodge, honestly. But uh, it's all cracked <laughs> because the wood soaks up moisture, it swells up, and then it cracks the plaster. So we had to do a project a couple of years ago where we stripped the walls and put up actual wire mesh and plaster over that. But we've still got some left in the dining hall where just the sort of lack of forethought and the frugality of our previous members said, oh, let's do this cheap. Uh, I know Oli down at the mill and he'll give us some plywood seconds. We'll just slap some plaster over it and call it good. Well, that is not the approach to take when you have a historic structure. And like you're talking about, Sister Emily, with these beautiful, beautiful pieces of funerary architecture. You know, you have these wonderful marble and granite monuments and they're so beautiful and they're carved and then someone comes in with an angle grinder and a pressure washer and turns them into a lump of stone it's like great thank you you've preserved nothing now well and they're not coming back no That's they're not the thing. <laughs> when, when, when you lose it it's gone yeah those those are kind of a one-shot deal you get <laughs> one shot to take care of it properly and uh, hopefully you make the best of that. Well, before we wrap it up here and move on to our odd pods, is there anything uh, that any of you would like to add in to this episode? You know, I, I, this is a strange comment maybe, but I, I've been thinking about and talking about the history of the cemetery. And, and I think you know, for me, it was sort of the indomitable spirit of, of the, the odd fellows for, uh, over the last 150 years. And, I think that's something we can all learn from. Uh, one quick story: after the Civil War, you know, Civil War is big in the South, right? And after I've the Civil that. War, the Odd Fellows, mm-hmm. yeah, and the Odd Fellows here made up, if, if you will, uh, reconciled with the Odd Fellows from other parts of the country almost immediately. In fact, I believe, based on my research, that they were the first organization to say, "Okay, what happened happened, but let's move on," and they did so almost immediately. And I think it. It spoke volumes about these these men, and they were all men at the time, uh, and their spirit, you know, their spirit of forgiveness, their spirit of hope for the future. And believe me, uh, there was not a lot of reason for hope at that time. Um, and but they have, you know, their spirit enabled them to survive all those years. And I think there's something there for us today in terms of never giving up. You know, this organization has a long illustrious history, and and we sh- we should learn from that. And, take, and embrace those lessons going forward. Yes, and bravo to all of you down there in Louisiana who have put in the hard work to start rebuilding Odd Fellowship in the Pelican State because not every jurisdiction is so lucky to have young, active, really involved, interested people who are willing to put in that effort. I've been a part of efforts to revive lodges here in my jurisdiction. And I know it takes a lot of attention, takes a lot of effort. And so on behalf of all of us, we all really appreciate everything that you have done there and especially bringing Odd Fellowship back to New Orleans after 40 years. Can I mention one more thing? Um, Sure. Yeah, so I just wanna mention that um, we do have uh, in Louisiana, another lodge that's about to be chartered, Themis Lodge number 75 on November 14th. Hopefully, we'll receive their charter. Um, there's about five uh, members there, but uh, it looks like they, they're going to do a degree date at same day, and uh, their numbers will increase immediately. So we're looking forward to that, and uh, that would give us one more lodge in Louisiana. Um, and Crescent City, just so your listeners know, is while the, the Odd Fellows Rest Cemetery belongs to the Louisiana Grand Lodge, we do intend and will take on it as a uh, charity project to raise money and support our local cemetery. And we're looking forward to do that through some coins we're going to have made and sold. And um, we we just want to see it uh, continue and and not go away. And we want to get it open, hopefully. And I don't want to, I'm not speaking in capacity as Deputy Grand Master, but as a dues paying member, I do believe that there is plans for, and I do think in the near future, it will be open to the public, but I can't promise, fingers crossed, but there is an effort to get it open to the public. Yeah, I understand there are a lot of variables when you're talking about something that is so historic and so fragile. 
Um, you know, I understand you can't necessarily promise anything, but it's great that you guys are thinking of doing that because especially for other odd fellows coming to New Orleans to visit, uh, that is a really important part of our shared heritage as an organization. Of the four things we pledge ourselves to do, that is one of them. We do bury the dead. And that's an obligation that all of us take very seriously uh, to care for our cemeteries and to take care of the, the remains of those members who have gone to the Great Lodge Hall beyond. And so uh, I applaud all of you for working so hard on the cemetery and also just uh, reviving Odd Fellowship in New Orleans. I have yet another reason to come down and visit. Uh, and Toby, I need to bring up one more thing. Um, oh, yes. I know I said last time. One of the biggest questions I get on Facebook, and I've just realized this, and um, Ansley does a really good job of tagging me in posts about Odd Fellows Rest Cemetery, and I appreciate that. The biggest question we get is, can we go in and why can't we go in? And I, while Michael can probably answer this better, I can basically tell you it's a working construction site. There are extension cords. Uh, one of the tombs is not safe to be near. It is a working construction site. And uh, maybe Michael can explain better, but uh, please be patient for everybody within the sound of my voice. Uh, we are doing our best, but I get this all the time on Facebook. Uh, why can't we go in? And that's why it's a working construction site. I, th I think that's that's as good an explanation as any, Eddie. And, and it, it, we have a little sign by the entrance that says, please bear with us. And, you know, obviously there's a, some cost involved with this, quite a bit of cost involved. And it's, it's, um, it's a multi-year project um, that we're engaged in right now. I mean, we probably have another year or two, I would think, before we're comfortable letting people in. We have at least one of our largest tomb in there is, is, is to be kind, is probably near collapse at this point, partial collapse. And we certainly don't want it to collapse on any of our visitors. So we, we generally tend to keep people out. If we allow people in, as we do on, on All Saints Day, we'll be open for a few hours. I, I pretty much control. I don't let people just wander aimlessly around the cemetery. I, I control their activities. Uh, they don't quite understand that, or I'll, or I'll give a tour if, if necessary. But I don't, I don't let people just wander around for the reason Eddie mentioned. It is a construction site. All right. Well, that moves us on to the odd pod. Uh, just a quick note for the listeners: um, because of the short turnaround time on recording this episode, we don't have a lot shout out for this episode. But uh, there will be one coming up in our next episode. So be sure and get those suggestions into us for the Lodge shout out because we want to share the great things that are happening all around Odd Fellowship. So if you've got a Lodge that's doing something wonderful, you're growing, you're taking on projects, you're getting new members in, you're having fun, you're experiencing Odd Fellowship, tell us about it. We want to share that with everybody. So this moves us into the Odd Pods where everybody gets to share Something special uh, doesn't necessarily have to be related to our topic today. Uh, which one of you would like to go first for the odd podge? Pretty much, uh, I stick to the same thing. Uh, I'm just still working on uh, getting people connected to the right places. So um, same thing, if you have any questions, if you're trying to find a lodge close to you, if you want uh, some more information as far as some of the information that we went over today, you can always send us an email. Um, our email is the number three links oddcast at gmail.com. That's the number three links oddcast at gmail.com. And then we also have uh, our website, which is three spelled out T H R E E um, links oddcast.com. And if you're trying to get some more information, please send us, um, send us an email, get a hold of us. We also have an uh, Instagram. And right now we have uh, quite a bit of activity in the San Diego area. So if you're out there in San Diego, close to San Diego, uh, we want to hear from you. We have quite a few people interested. So hopefully we could get something going again in San Diego. Yeah, that would be fantastic. All right, Brother Eddie, do you have something for the odd podge? Well, I mean, I probably should have saved some of the stuff I already said, but just, you know, um, we have a lodge of uh, chartering on November 14th. I'm just, I can't be more excited for them. They were supposed to be chartered at the grand session this past March, but then 
and this is before Louisiana shut down, but uh, Joyce, Jimmy, and, and myself, the executive board, made the wise decision to cancel the grand session. So they had to wait for their charter, and uh, they've been patient, and it's coming for them. And we're, we do have uh, some interested members in Lake Charles area, which they just, despite the hurricane, the two hurricanes that yeah. hit out there, they, um, they did, uh, they, there's some interest in um, joining there. And there's actually a lodge that's there that's not doing too well, and hopefully that will change. Um, our Crescent City Lodge um, did do a, fun, a food drive, I should mention. We collected 62 pounds of food, and we brought it to um, an organization called Second Harvest. And um, we plan on doing that again. Um, and that was basically right after hurricane, um, uh, the hurricane we just had. And uh, the first one, was it Laura or Sally? I forget. Um, Laura. There's but, been so many. It was Laura. Uh, yeah. I know it's, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, Hurricane Laura. After Hurricane Laura, we decided to do the food drive. So we're trying to live the principles of Odd Fellowship at our lodge. Excellent. Uh, how about Brother Michael? What do you have you'd like to share for the Odd Pod? Uh, I have no, no, really no further insight. I, I just want to say I appreciate the opportunity uh, on behalf of the cemetery um, to, um, to talk with you today. And hopefully we've, we've shared some interesting points that members of the order can, can appreciate. And uh, if you're in the New Orleans area, uh, I'm, we, we do give tours to Odd Fellows. Um, um, so it, I don't, I don't want to give the information over the podcast, but, um, there are ways to get in touch with me if you need to, and you're here and you'd like me to give you a personal tour of the cemetery. I'd be happy to do that. So. Excellent. Thank you so much. And sister Emily, uh, what about you? What do you have to share with us? Well, um, sort of cemetery related, uh, Michael kind of touched on it already. Um, for us in New Orleans, it's not just the Halloween season, it's also the season that's leading up to All Saints Day, uh, yes. which is a Catholic holiday. Um, it's, it's celebrated, you know, in Louisiana in general. Um, it's not always Catholics that celebrate it, though. It's become a little bit of a, con like a cultural institution uh, in general. And then, of course, obviously, in other Catholic places too, you know, Mexico, uh, in Central America, France, uh, I'm pretty sure of Montreal. Um, this is a really great time to see cemeteries in general as a place where, you know, places that are really deeply cared about, you know, and, you know, that's not just New Orleans. That's for, you know, anybody, any place. This is a, a really wonderful time to visit a cemetery. Remember that, you know, the people, are, you know, that the other people in the cemetery are probably visiting loved ones of their own. Uh, finding your loved ones in a cemetery, you know, going to, to your own family burial ground and appreciating it, decorating it. <laughs> it's a silly thing to say, but, but what I've been having to explain to people is this is kind of, for us cemetery folks, this is sort of our Mardi Gras, you know, this is, this is our, um, this is the time of year when we really receive, you know, we see a lot of care and, um, you know, I just want to encourage that in folks to, to appreciate cemeteries for, for what they are, uh, in their, really their special holiday, you know. And think of it differently, you know, this time of year, and of course, why are we talking about cemeteries right before Halloween? It's because this is the time of year that the general public is open to messages about cemeteries because they tend to think of cemeteries as being these spooky places, ooh. But really, they are memorial parks. They are places that are dedicated to the idea of memorializing people just like ourselves who existed before us. And it is an amazing way to make that connection with several generations of people from before our own time. Speaking personally, I'm of Swedish descent. And so my family immigrated from Sweden to this country in the 1880s. And when I go to the old Lutheran cemetery where my family is buried, that goes back four generations. And I see the original headstones that are carved in Swedish. And that carries on, you know, my great, great grandfather, my great grandfather, my grandfather's buried there. And one day, hopefully, if they have room, I will be buried there as well. And so I will get to contribute to that memorial idea uh, in the cemetery. You know, I've, I've, I've said many times that if you really want to know about and understand the history of a community, 
you go to the cemeteries. And th- that I, I absolutely believe that you can learn more about the history of a city from a cemetery than I think any other single place other than perhaps a history museum. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a repository of generations of, of, of residents of your community, um, a, a mixture of, of immigrant groups and, and natives. And it, it's, it's, they are fascinating. They're in, and, and I know Emily feels the same way. They are endlessly fascinating places to visit, even if you have no family there. Yeah, absolutely. It is such a wonderful record of civilization to be able to look at a cemetery and see how it has changed over the years. Well, thank you so much for being willing to share your time and expertise and your enthusiasm here on the Three Links Oddcast. We've had Brother Eddie LaBeouf III, Brother thank Michael you for having us. Plantier, and Sister Emily Ford from Crescent City Lodge 73 in New Orleans. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.